when we find a skull like this a million years ago, maybe not this specific example, but when you find one from way long ago, do you think sometimes we might find something that we don't even realize was walking around in a world that had obviously not the same thing because there's always different iterations in this theory, but that maybe had things that were technologically equivalent to an iPhone and then an extinction event happened and suddenly something like New York City is just rubble? There's a strange exponential curve with which we how look at with which we look at time as far as like in the modern day bias. I talked about this with with Gnostic informant when he was here, but it's like when we look at the last you know, we're both of this era. So you look at the last 30 years, it seems like pretty similar part of, you know, one thing came after another. Then you look a hundred years out and you're like, wow, that was a while ago. But now that you got to a hundred, when you go 200 years back, the distance between the hundred and 200 in your mind that you're looking at shrinks and 200 to 400 shrinks and 400 to a thousand shrinks. And suddenly you start to make a leap such that you can look at some history of a Roman emperor in 50 AD and look at another one in 400 AD, 350 years apart, and assume it's like a very similar era. So now extrapolate that to, oh, you know, we thought we were like 6,000 years old. By the way, nope, we're actually 100,000. Nope, we're 200. Nope, we're 300. Oh, that we're a million. Yeah. The jumps here that you're making, think about all the extinctions that could have happened, that definitely happened in between all those times as well. It's like you are unearthing, no pun intended. <laughs> So many different segments of history in one fell swoop, but treating it like one discovery. It's so, that's so fascinating to me. Yeah, and I think we it's, it's almost the way, as you say, we look at the world. Like we have a very warped perception of time, mm -hmm. and you know we can because we only think in like very short time scales, like our own life. You know, like a hundred years at most, or. Yeah. Potentially, if you're looking at the whole history of civilizations, you can kind of sort of conceptualize it like 5,000 years or whatever. But then once you get up to these massive, massive, massive timescales, 100,000 years, 300,000 years, potentially up to a million years, our human brain can't really like think about that. It, right. it doesn't really compute up there. So I think that's potentially where many people go wrong and potentially why we have, I believe, some kind of recency bias when we look at history and we think that everything that's happened in the last few thousand years, the stuff we can see is all that's happened. You know, mm. we think that because we can see that, that's the only sophisticated era of human history. We live at the pinnacle of human history and we may do, but that doesn't mean that nothing else happened in, you know, the 99% of human history that came before that we can't see. And think of all the human lives, all the stories, all the cultures, all the potential, you know, achievements that our species have made in that vast length of time that we have lost and, yeah, that we can't see anymore. And it's, it's fascinating to me. Hey guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. So yeah, that's why I do what I do. Have you ever had that stomach sinking moment when you check your bank statement and see that unexpected charge? Or maybe even worry about where your card details are stored every time you shop at a new website. That's certainly something I think about a lot. Luckily for both of us, the solution here is privacy, not the word, the company. Privacy is a consumer protection focused brand that lets you generate unique virtual card numbers for every business or purchase. This is the ultimate online security. I use their merchant locked cards for subscriptions like Netflix or Amazon because that card literally only works with that one business. That means that if that business ever has a data breach, again, this could be Amazon, Netflix, whoever, my actual bank information is going to be shielded. And on top of that, I get a notification if anyone tries to use the card elsewhere. I love being able to pause, set spending limits, or delete a card anytime. It keeps me in complete control. Now, it's also important to note that privacy doesn't ever sell customer data for any reason. Protecting your privacy isn't just a part of their business, it is quite literally in their name. Like other card companies, their revenue comes from transaction fees called interchange from businesses. With privacy, it's easy to sign up and incredibly fast to use. They have a free plan with no transaction fees for domestic purchases. So start protecting your financial identity today. Go to privacy.com slash Julian, that link is in my description below. That's P-R-I-V-A-C-Y dot com slash Julian to get your $5 sign up bonus today. That $5 can be used on your first purchase. So click the link in my description and make privacy a part of your daily routine. Thank you to Privacy for sponsoring today's video. <laughs> Do you think that 
when we find a skull like this a million years ago, maybe not this specific example, but when you find one from way long ago, do you think sometimes we might find something that we don't even realize was walking around in a world that had obviously not the same thing because there's always different iterations in this theory, but that maybe had things that were technologically equivalent to an iPhone and then an extinction event happened and suddenly something like New York City is just rubble? Well, I would... I wouldn't say there's evidence of this, but I would say it's it's possible, you mm. know, because another thing when you get up to these huge timescales is the preservation problem, right? Like what realistically is going to survive that long? If something, not maybe not like New York City, but some kind of settlement existed 100,000 years ago, right. what realistically would we expect to survive now, 100,000 years in the future? Like what's going to be left? It's really hard for materials to survive that long. And especially if you think about the kind of things that humans were likely building with, which is the things they find in their environment, you know, like wood or something or plants mm -hmm. or reeds or anything that they would find around them to build with, it's just going to decay. Like the earth is an incredible recycling machine of destruction effectively. And we're, we kind of underestimate, in my view, the sheer destructive nature of our planet mm -hmm. when it comes to erasing our human past. And I always think, you know, Humans like us, with a mind like us, and that's a debatable point which I want to get into, is the in kind of history of intelligence and whether we did have a mind like us for this long. But in my view, we've had a mind like ours for at least 300,000 years, potentially much longer than that. What does that mean? Like, what could we have been doing in that time and what would we realistically see left to prove it? I want to get into that, but even even before we go down that rabbit hole, it's also like, what about population sizes too? Because like, if we have a brain that's of this capacity, it's one thing when you're working in a population of, you know, ten thousand of us who aren't even connected with the internet or something like that. And now you're working in a world of eight billion people, four, three to four billion of which are connected on the internet at any given time and can exchange ideas at the fastest rate in human history. It's like may have the same power, but we have significantly more resources and scale to be able to, you know, put something like this in our hands or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they couldn't have come up with amazing shit at a smaller population with this little thing popping around up there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's a good point to be fair. Like more people, you have more chance of a lone genius coming up with something or people just being able to connect together and work together, especially in our connected society. Mm -hmm. Like, yes. But something I always think about when I look at past populations of humans is we don't really know how high the population levels were because we have these things called genetic bottlenecks. So if you look throughout history, like if you look at the genetics of our species, you have these moments in time where the population crashes and like almost all of humans are wiped out. But what that means is only a very small amount of the kind of gen genetic information survives. Right. So you can't really tell, like you can tell at this point, there are only like, you know, 10,000 individuals left. So you only get the, their genes passing through. So you don't know what you've lost, if that makes sense. Because if everyone's dead or everyone's been wiped out, you don't have their genetic information passed through. You've only got the 10,000 people that survive through this bottleneck. So there could be anything happening before then. It doesn't mean there was. Genes die off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. It, you can't prove that there wasn't, you know, millions of humans 200,000 years ago. It doesn't mean there was, but you can't prove that there wasn't. Which I always find I always find that really interesting because Thank you guys for watching the episode. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and smash that like button on the video. They're both a huge, huge help. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram and X, those links are in my description below.